low carbohydrate foods in the Caribbean, and it's on every year in May. And you should go, if you can possibly go, you will meet 250 people, like the people around you, a lot of these 250 people have been doing this for a long time. Let's see you start. <laughs> Don't I wish. It's one, one, one. And I've mentioned the website, and I think I've said enough. Um, an intro for Jimmy, and he will tell the rest of the story. Can you scroll back? Ready to start? stepping to the side thing with the clicker. Can everybody hear me okay? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm a little louder than that man, but uh, my name is Jimmy Moore. I am from South Carolina in the United States. I'm very happy to be in your country. Wow. What a, an amazing country. The food here, oh my gosh. It is so good. Do you know how good your food is? You should be very appreciative. Definitely support farmers. Go buy their eggs, go buy their beef. It's good stuff. Um, if I had a farm like yours, I would be coming every day. <laughs> because you just don't have that in America. Unfortunately, it's, it's not as, as accessible as it is here in Australia. So thank you for having me. Oh, I forgot to get my, my little uh, token Australian friend. Good luck. <laughs> Can I do okay? We've been working on that. So uh, as Rod has told you, I do have a pretty popular blog and podcast, um, lots of really great um, information for people. I don't charge a dime for people to read the blog, so definitely go check it out. It's called Living Levino Low Carb. Um, if you just Google that, you'll, trust me, you'll find it. So, uh, but I wanted to talk to you about something, um, well first let me tell you my story. That was me, nine years ago, almost, um, back in 2004. Big boy there, was I? How many have done a low carb diet in here? Okay, good, good measure. The rest of you will get you on a low carb diet by the time you leave. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but that man right there, he's smiling, but he's not happy. He weighed 410 pounds, which helped me with the kilos there, Mr. Rod. 185, maybe something. 185 ish kilos. <laughs> But I decided to start something that I had never done before. I had always done low-fat diets. Who's ever been on a low-fat diet in here? Thank you very much. All of us. I mean, it's, it's the kind of the default diet when you're told to go on a diet. Oh, we've got to cut the calories. We've got to cut the fat. You've got to start exercising until you drop. I mean, that's kind of what we've been told you have to do. But hopefully by now, after hearing Rod talk, you know that's just not true. So, I go on this diet called the Atkins Diet. Who's heard of the Atkins Diet? Okay. So, my dear mother-in-law, this is my wife up here on the front row, but her, her mom bought me Dr. Atkins Diet Revolution, a new diet revolution book, and she had bought me diet books over the years because I've always been big, and she was worried I was going to leave her daughter early in this world. And so, I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, here's another diet book. Great. Thanks, Mom. But I read it, and I said, you know, this guy is whacked. He's telling me to eat more fat. Doesn't he know that's going to clog your arteries? Doesn't he know that packs on the pounds? And then he says, cut your carbs. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Carbs is what gives you energy. Why would I cut my carbs? But I had surmised after years of doing low-fat diet, low-fat diet, low-fat diet. None of that worked. In fact, in 1999, I did a pretty much no-fat diet where I ate basically carbs and a little protein and no fat. Lost 170 pounds, which was about maybe, what, 76 or 7 kilos? 
was pretty substantial. But guess what? I was irritable. I was hungry. Who, who's been on a diet and has been hungry? Why do we do that to ourselves? And just over and over and over, we almost have been given permission to be hungry. Because when you eat a low-fat diet, you're going to be hungry. Because guess what? You're depriving so many parts of your body, things that it really wants. Your brain especially. Did you know this noggin up here is two-thirds fat? Well, if you don't eat fat, how's it going to get fat up there, which you need for fuel? So I go on this diet, started January 1st, 2004. So I'm coming up on my nine years since I started this. I look like that. And the first few days of going low carb, so those of you who raised your hand, it's kind of rough, isn't it? Especially when you've been eating bad. And if you think you ate bad, listen to what my typical uh, day was like. Who, who has had a Coca-Cola? Okay, this ought to be fun, right? How many have drank two Coca-Colas in a day? Raise your hand. Three. Four. Anybody still raising their hand besides me? Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Let me keep going. Sixteen cans of Coca-Cola every single day. And you don't even want me to see how much teaspoons of sugar that was. It was off the charts. In addition to that, I would be having two whole boxes of like these little snack cakes. We call them Little Debbies in America. Whole boxes of them. Another <laughs> number of sugar grams in there. And it was just hard. And then I'd go by, I know you have McDonald's. I saw two on the way here. Uh, go by McDonald's and get like sausage, egg, and cheese biscuits, two of them. And then go by 7-Eleven, which I know you also have as well and not get, just get the gulp, or the big gulp, or the super big gulp. We had something in America called a double gulp, and it literally was this tall, that big around. It was basically like a Kentucky Fried Chicken bucket full of Coca-Cola. And I would drink one or two of those a day. So, pretty bad, right? Yeah. No wonder I look like that. So, I had a size 62 inch waist. I wore five XL shirts. I was on three prescription medications for high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and I started to have a wheezing problem, so I had a little breathing issue. So I was on all these drugs. Oh, what the heck are you doing? You're digging yourself in early grave is what you're doing. I was 32 years old in that picture. Um, I'm now 40, I'll turn 41. Uh, but I started on this Atkins diet, so high fat, moderated protein, low carb. January 1st, 2004, started off as a New Year's resolution, went on to become what I like to tell people, a new life resolution. Because if you don't make this something you're going to do for the rest of your life, don't bother. You're just going to, well, I just need to lose, you know, 10 kilo for that event that's coming up, the wedding or whatever. And, and then go back to the way I was eating. Don't bother. Why would you do that? You need to make this a lifelong thing. Because I didn't become that or who I am today by just doing this as a temporary diet. It had to be something that was a permanent, healthy lifestyle change. Till that happened, till that click happened in my head, nothing was going to change. So you might be wondering, how'd it go? Well, I'm sitting up pretty well because I'm standing here today. I don't look like that anymore. First month, I lost 30 pounds. Help me with kilos again. 14, 15 yeah. kilos. Um, second month, I was so energized from, so I was all the way down to 380 pounds. Uh, and so I said, okay, I'm going to start exercising. So I exercised a bit, just a little bit, and continued the diet, and another 40 pounds came off. At the end of 100 days, I had lost 100 pounds. And by the end of the year, as you see on the screen, I lost 82 kilos, 180 pounds. That was pretty that was fun. And everything was going really well. I started a blog the very next year. The Atkins people contacted me. They said, hey, we want to get your story out there. They put it on their website. And I got emails from around the world. I, I even remember we got a couple from Australia. Uh, people want, how'd you do it? How'd you do it? How'd you do it? So I started getting all this information from people that wanting information. And so I decided to create a blog called, as Living Libido Low Carb, as he told you. 
um, and I've gone on to do several things. I'm constantly trying to educate, encourage, and inspire people because I know how hard it is to be in that body. And even if you're not obese, morbidly obese like I was, you might be having a health issue. You might have a family member that might be having a weight or health issue. So this means a lot to me. I don't just do this flippantly. I do this as a very serious thing in my life. Uh, I feel like I have to pay it forward for the miracle that happened to me because that's cool. And I want other people to uh, get to experience it. But in the nine years that have followed, everything has got to be just perfect, right? Weight and health just stay exactly the same. You hit your goal and you stay there for the rest of your life, right? Eh, not exactly. In 2006, a couple of years after, or yeah, about a year and a half after I lost my weight, I put on an extra 15 pounds to get back up to 245 pounds or 111 kilos. Still a pretty respectable weight, right? 2007, another 15 pounds comes on to get up to 118 kilos. All right. 2008, another 15 pounds goes on for 125 kilos. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, um, hello, dummy, uh, wake up. You're gaining weight. Do something about it. Well, I was. I was trying my darndest. I was doing the same things that helped me lose the 180 pounds in 2004, exactly the same. Low fat, moderated protein, and or, or high fat, excuse me, oof, not low fat. High fat, moderated protein, low carb, it was not working. And I tweak things here and do things there. And of course, I, I started interviewing different people on my podcast, and I'd listen to some of the things they said and would try those. Nothing was working. Flash forward, 2009, another 15 pounds. Now, at this point, it started to get serious because I'm back up to 132 kilos, 290 pounds. Not happy. That was not fun. All right, so the last couple of years, we've seen an additional 10 pounds for the first time since I lost the weight. I got back above 300 pounds, 139 kilos. Not fun at all. Little by little, they added up quick. I mean, look at that. It didn't seem like a whole lot, 15 pounds, 10, 15 pounds a year. Uh, what's that, five or six kilos a year? It doesn't sound like a whole lot. But when you do it in successive years, doing what you think is the right thing, it adds up extremely quick. So needless to say, I was quite frustrated. So it was earlier this year that I was at a conference. That was me back in March at a conference in Austin, Texas. A health conference where we're talking about low carb and paleo and all these concepts. That was me. I was not happy looking like that. That was me on the low carb cruise this year when uh, your dearly beloved uh, Rod was there. That's how he met me. And he's still inviting me to Australia. <laughs> Just kidding. And of course, that's my lovely wife, Christine, who's never had a weight problem in her life. <laughs> but 139 kilos. That was unacceptable. So for the first time in over eight years of eating low carb, I got back above that level, and it was horrible. So there's a picture that Christine took with her iPhone of me before the low carb cruise. You can see I have gained a lot of weight in the midsection. And again, that is on what I thought was a pretty good low carb diet. So I'm smiling in that picture, but I was definitely not happy. This is how I felt. Anybody been there? Yeah. So how could this possibly be happening on a really good, high-fat, low-carb diet? I read this book. If, you, if you've never heard of Dr. Jeff Bullock or Dr. Stephen Finney, you need to write their names down. You need to write the name of this book down because it's going to change your life. It rocked my world forever. They are two of the preeminent researchers of low-carbohydrate nutrition. They've been studying this stuff combined 50 years between the two of them. I think they know a thing or two about it. I've been very fortunate to call them friends for many years, but until they wrote this book, it never happened. So Rod told you about my N equals one concept on my website, liveinlevitalowcarb.com slash blog, or you just Google Jimmy Moore Low Carb, you'll find it. At the very top of my blog, you'll see a little tab that says N equals one, and it'll take you to this page. But basically, it's just self-testing. 
you're the one when in the n equals one. It's kind of a scientific concept where you're the one studying yourself. And so I wanted to study why did I get back above 300 pounds again for the first time in eight years, nine years. So I started this concept that Bullock and Finney talked about in their book, The Art and Science of Low Carbohydrate Performance, called Nutritional Ketosis. Now, who in here has heard of ketosis before? Okay. So I began this test in uh, May 15, 2012. Now, it's different than the urine test. Who, who has tested their, like, urine ketones before? So you pee on a stick and it shows you pink or purple or whatever. Okay? That's an inaccurate way to measure ketones. And we'll talk about that here. I got a precision extra, I think it's called the Freestyle Optium here in Australia, a ketone meter that measures your blood ketones. Now, the urine ketones you'll see down there, uh, they only measure acetoacetate, okay? Blood ketones actually measure another ketone called beta-hydroxybutyrate. Now, this is kind of fancy schmancy. Don't let that scare you. Let's just put it this way. Beta-hydroxybutyrate is the kind that's in your blood that you're using for fuel in the absence of carbs. When you cut your carbs down, and we'll talk about the protein cutting that down as well, and raise your fat, you're creating beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is what you want to... Measuring the urine ketone, the acetoacetate, is pretty much useless. So if you've been frustrated and you've been doing really well in your low carb and you see uh, you know, pink or purple on, on the uh, strip, the urine strip, and you're not losing weight, well, maybe you're not in true nutritional ketosis. So we're going to get into that. My first blood ketone reading was 0.3 millimolar. That's low. And we'll talk about what optimal levels here in a minute. So again, I thought I was eating a really good, high-fat, low-carb diet. All right, so there's some basic tools that I've been using to measure on my N equals 1. So any good experiment needs some good tools, right? So let's take a look at some of these. All right, so we have, thank you. First off, we have a blood ketone meter. So this is the one I use. It's called Precision Extra. And then we also have a blood glucose meter. I get this from Walmart in America. And then uh, a bathroom scale, which, you know what a bathroom scale is, a little blood bathroom scale. But those are the three tools, okay? So with those three tools, I embarked on this N equals one. So what was I looking for, okay? Obviously body weight changes. Who has stepped on a scale in this room? Everybody. <laughs> And body weight changes are important, but they're not the be-all, end-all. Too many people, uh, y'all have Biggest Loser here in Australia, right? The Biggest Loser, the TV show. So what do they measure their success? You know, and they lose 14 pounds or whatever, right? So that's the only measure of success they have on shows like that. That's not the only measure of success that I was looking at. That was just one. Another one is the blood sugar changes, so the blood glucose monitor, blood ketone changes, which we'll get in here in a minute. This is a key here, how you look, form, perform, and feel, because all of those things are important. Intangibles like sleep, body fat loss, muscle growth, exercise performance, which I'll show you all the results of that here in a minute, and literally observing everything that's happening about my health and well-being throughout this experiment, and I'll just give you kind of a side note. Since I've been in Australia, uh, it's been interesting because some of my numbers like started moving around, and so it was kind of neat to see travel even impacts a lot of things. Now, since I've been in Australia and eating a really good food here, I've lost like three or four or five pounds. I'm loving that. So I should move here and keep losing. No, I'm just kidding. So blood ketones. What are you looking for? This is a chart that's out of the Art and Science of Low Carbohydrate Performance book. You'll see nutritional ketosis begins at right around 0.5 millimolar, and the optimal zone kind of reaches a peak right around 3.0 millimolar, and then it goes down. Now, you might be looking at words like starvation ketosis and ketoacidosis. Anybody in here a type 1 diabetic? Type 1 diabetic? Nobody? Then you don't have to worry about this, because only type 1s have to worry about ketoacidosis. 
My blood ketones have gotten as high as 6.7. That's really high. But I was not starving by any means, and I certainly haven't even reached close to ketoacidosis, which is 10.0 millimolar. So don't let that be a, a something that would stop you from trying this. All right, so what were the mistakes? What were the things that were putting on those 15 pounds of seven to eight kilos every year for successive years? Let's take a look. Anybody eat like this? Chicken breast on a salad? Yeah. Looks like a pretty healthy, low-carb meal, right? <laughs> Consuming way too much protein was probably the number one problem that I had. Now, how many has heard a low-carb diet is a high-protein diet? We see it in the media. I've seen it in your media. It's in my media. It's everywhere. It's horrible because it's not a high-protein diet. By definition, a well-formulated low-carb diet is actually high in fat, and it is. Now, here's that term that uh, Rod was telling you about, how the body turns some protein into sugar in your body. Did you know that if you ate too much protein, it's actually just like eating chocolate cake? Not kidding. It is. Because of that big fancy G word, gluconeogenesis, and it's where you eat too much protein, and it converts it through the liver into glucose in the body. Did anybody know that? I didn't know that. So guess what? Those lean meats like chicken, <laughs> turkey, and even some of the, like the, I went to the farmer's market earlier today and I saw they had super lean ground beef. Why would I do that? That's just horrible. Leave the fat in. Don't let that cow die in vain, right? So lean meats are never a smart choice when you look for a lifestyle. You always want to try to choose the fattiest cuts of meat, and I'd say add more fat to that. So what you're trying to do, or what I was trying to do, is maybe limit the absolute amount of protein. So perhaps I was eating 175 grams of protein, not even 150. Cut that down. And it's gonna to have to be kind of an individualized thing. I can't give you exact figures for you. You kind of have to like tinker with it. I personally cut mine down between 80 to 100 grams of protein a day. And that has worked for me. So those 80 to 100 grams of protein uh, work out to about 12% of my total caloric intake during this experiment. So we've already talked about the uh, key stakes why they're probably not very good. And that's my number two mistake. I was relying on those urine ketone sticks to tell me whether I was in ketosis or not. So low carbs have always done that. Urine uh, sticks turn pink to purple for ketosis. Unfortunately, they're not as accurate. Beta hydroxybutyrate is a ketone that you're wanting to test for, and the only way you can test for it is by pricking your finger and putting it on a blood machine, which, by the way, I'm going to do that for you, now, although it's very cold in this building. I don't know if I'll be able to get some blood out of it. I'll try. I'll, I'll help Jimmy. Don't there you worry. go. I'm sure you will. <laughs> Just not right here. So measuring blood ketones determines whether your body is burning fat or not. Because who wants to burn fat? I mean, everybody. I mean, whether you're thin or morbidly obese, you want to be burning fat for fuel, not carbohydrate. So the Precision Extra, which is the one I use, again, this is called Freestyle Optium here in Australia. It's a very reliable meter for testing blood ketones. Testing strips in, in America can cost $6 a strip. So we're like not the lucky ones. You guys are the lucky ones because it's much less than a dollar for a strip. So is, is your health worth maybe a dollar a day or every few days? I think so. So here's a biggie. Fat does not make you fat. So let's please stop with the fat phobia. I think our, our grandmothers and great-grandmothers would be turned over in their graves if they knew how much we were bellyaching about fat. My problem was, I was eating a lot of fat, I thought, but obviously not enough. So not consuming enough dietary fat, and I, and I blame it on the darn low-fat propaganda, because everywhere in your supermarkets, I haven't been in one of your supermarkets, because quite frankly, I've seen enough of them in America, and they're probably just the same here in Australia. It's garbage. It's low fat this, it's low fat that. And that's just detrimental. 
So many who begin a low-carb diet combine it with low-fat and they have the chicken breast on the salad and they think, oh, I'm eating so healthy. Aren't I good? So when you cut the fat, guess what happens? Hunger and cravings hits you right smack between the eyeballs. So there's really no harm that comes from ramping up your fat intake. I'm currently, hold on to your hats here, eating 85% of my diet is fat. Now some people have said, so what are you doing, chugging oil, chugging butter, and you're eating whole sticks of butter? You know, don't think of it in that way because remember, fat has nine calories per gram. Carbohydrate and protein only has four calories per gram. So you're really not talking about the same one-to-one -one ratio between those. There's probably about twice, a little over actually, twice as much fat calories as there are uh, protein and carbohydrate. So you only need to cut the amount that you're thinking in your head in half. And then even from there, you know, don't get so caught up in, oh, well, I've got to keep it limited. No, don't worry about fat. You cannot eat too much fat. Naturally, hot or fat foods will help you get into ketosis. It will, and I'll show you here in a minute. So let's take a look. Some, who was that that asked the question about what, what do you eat? Somebody while ago had a question for Rod. What, what, what do you eat? I'm about to show you 12 foods that you can eat to add more fat to your diet. Avocados, or as y'all call them here, what is it? Avos, right? Is that right? So avocados, who eats avocados? Oh, I love you guys. Of course, you've got the good avocados here in Australia. When we went through the market, I was like, oh my gosh, they're like that big. Those are like watermelons in America. <laughs> we get the little baby ones. It's like, oh, we're so lucky. No, we're not. Okay. Grass-fed butter. Who has that grass-fed butter? Your butter here is amazing too, by the way. And, of course, pastured eggs. And I say pastured eggs because you get the better quality. Of course, all, all the eggs I've seen in this town so far, in this uh, country so far, has just been amazing. Coconut oil. Who eats coconut oil? Y'all don't need my help. Y'all are eating all the right foods, it looks like. Bacon. Who eats bacon? Yeah, baby. Sour cream. Wow. Grass-fed beef. All right, cheddar cheese or any kind of hard cheese. Coconut, who eats coconut here? I don't really like coconut, but I eat it every once in a while for the health benefits. Remember, these are all good, high-fat foods that are going to help you get the ketone levels you want. Dark chocolate. Now, I personally like kind of 85%. I've tried some of like the really high ones, like 90 and 100 and going, ooh, 85 is about my threshold, but find that threshold because you look at the label, it really is high in fat from the cocoa butter and you get good stearic acid from that. Cream cheese. I'm loving you guys. You guys are awesome. <laughs> now, I use a liquid fish oil. I don't know if you can get this brand here in Australia or not. It's called Carlson's Liquid Fish Oil. It's basically a cod liver oil. Um, and it's a really good quality fish oil. So uh, definitely check it out. The worst case scenario, you should find it online. All right, so this is what I had to eat this week in Melbourne. My keto eggs brekkie. I shall only call it brekkie, right? Is that for breakfast? Okay. So you might look at that and go, uh, ew. Some people would because it's a lot of fat. But I cooked four of those beautiful deep orange eggs and just uh, in two tablespoons of grass-fed butter, I mixed in uh, two to three ounces of some hard cheese, and I put three tablespoons of sour cream on top of that. Most doctors would say you're asking for a heart attack. I say, look at my results, which we'll see here in a minute. The low carb does not mean a three for all, and this was the next mistake, number four, I was probably eating too much and eating too often. So do you count your calories? Well, yes and no. Once you're keto adapted, you don't really have to worry about it because your calories naturally drop. 
your hunger goes away, you end up spontaneously fasting. Now you might be thinking, okay, dude is talking about not eating? Why would I do that? Well, if you're satisfied with the foods that you're eating and your body is using ketones for fuel, you don't need to eat. And we drove all the way here today from Melbourne. We ate around like 12.30 or so, 12.45. I didn't eat until then. And then I have not eaten since then because I'm eating ketones. I shall talk, I shall see here in a minute. And the cool thing is your brain especially prefers ketones. Did you know that? Everybody thinks, oh, you need to eat glucose, you need to have sugar, because that gives your body energy and your brain needs it, and blah, 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 blah. Do I look like I'm like weak and tired right now because I'm on ketones? No. So I, I'm actually eating about 3% of my calories are coming from dietary carbohydrates during this experiment. And I have been spontaneously doing what they call IFE. That's intermittent fasting, and I'll tell you about that here in a second. But the uh, intermittent fast can go upwards of 12 to 24 hours. So my last meal was, say, 12.45 today. I probably won't eat again until maybe 9, 10, 11 o'clock tomorrow. That's a long time between meals. But guess what? I'm not hungry. I'm not irritable. I'm full of energy, right? There's really no need to be stuck on this three meals and snacks a day anymore. We've been told that. Oh, you need to eat, and, and Rod talked about it. He used to, every three hours, make sure that he had something to eat. How many have heard that? you got to do that. you got to keep your blood sugar stable. All right. So here's the sidebar on the intermittent fasting. It's also known as IF. It happens very naturally when you're in a state of nutritional ketosis. Do not force yourself. If you are hungry, will you please eat something? Because I used to try, I, I would hear, I would interview people on my podcast show that say, oh, intermittent fasting is the best thing since, okay, we, we don't eat sliced bread, but it's the best thing ever. And I would try it, and I'd be like, why am I so hungry? It's supposed to be the best thing ever. So don't force the issue. If you get hungry, that is a clue. Eat something. So make sure you're, one thing that will help you is make sure you're consuming enough fat and total calories in your meals so that the intermittent fasting will actually just happen on its own. I never sought out with this experiment to do intermittent fasting. I thought intermittent fasting was like the last thing in the world I would ever want to do. And yet it's just happened because when you're not hungry, you don't eat. That makes sense. So you can learn more about IF from people if you want to Google these names. Brad Pilon, John Berardi, Dr. Joe Mercola, and Rob Wolf. Uh, those are all really good resources for information about IF if you want to learn more. And again, be patient with yourself. Don't let intermittent fasting derail you in your nutritional ketosis plan. Just eat and fast intuitively. So if you're hungry, eat. If you're not, don't. Really no more uh, difficult than that. So uh, here's a lady that's, uh, her blood glucose is a little low, honey. Yeah, she's searching out the, anybody ever done that? Yeah. So the fifth mistake that I made in my low-carb diet before starting this nutritional ketosis was failing to properly stabilize blood sugar. So who in here has ever tested your blood sugar with a blood glucose meter? Oh, just a few. Okay, a few of you. So if you do not have something that measures your blood sugar, you need to go get one of these. And uh, this is one I get in America. I think you can actually double up on that, that one, the ketone meter. It also serves as a blood glucose meter. It's different strips for it, but to, invaluable. I wish everybody in the world had one of these and it's so accessible. Um, and I believe um, somebody told me you can get like 100 of the strips for a glucose meter for like, what, $30, $40 or something like that? Oh, twenty dollars. So it's very inexpensive. That, that's like twenty cents or so for it's forty-five, fifty cents, and even upwards of a dollar for the ones in America. So can you guys have it? Good. So you might be thinking, what in the world does blood glucose levels and nutritional ketosis have to do with each other? What I have seen in my experiment so far, which we're going to get into the details here in a second, when blood glucose is high your ketones tend to be low, and it's inverted. When you get your ketone levels up high enough, something magically happens to blood glucose. 
goes down. So get a, blood, a glucometer, get regular blood sugar readings. Your fasting blood sugar readings should be in the 80s in, in the, the measurements we use. I, I think that's like between four and five is what you're trying to see on the, on the readings, ideally. If you're not quite there, don't worry about it, but that's what you're shooting for. Raising blood ketones to 2.0 millimolar resulted in a dramatic shift downward in my blood sugar. There was no hunger, improved mood, a sense of uh, well-being, and having lower but not low blood sugar plus higher ketones is the sweet spot that you're looking for. So uh, you might want to take this exit. Thank you. All right, so I know you're asking, what kind of weight and health results have we seen doing this experiment? Because it's been about, I'm just past six months and I'm in the seventh month now. So here's some random observations that I've seen. It took me four days to get into nutritional ketosis. So I got about 0.5 or 6, right, Christine, in like the fourth day. So that's officially in nutritional ketosis. And Volk and Finney in their book say it can take upwards of two to four weeks. So you're not there in four days, don't worry. Just keep working on it, eat more fat, moderate the protein, moderate the carbohydrates, or lower the carbohydrates, and you should get there in due time. So I've remained in nutritional ketosis for most of that time. I did actually drop just this morning, just a little bit below uh, nutritional ketosis. It was 0.4, only because uh, it's been hard trying to acclimate to this country. <laughs> My sleep patterns have been off, and that will all affect your blood ketones, it appears. I have seen levels as high as 6.4, uh, consuming a fat protein carb ratio of 85-12-3 certainly has helped with that. I'm eating the best quality foods, so yeah, macronutrients matter, but so does quality of food, so make sure you're getting those foods we talked about earlier. Started doing the intermittent fasting like we talked about. I've also drank a lot of water, and I take regular supplements. I take a good multivitamin, vitamin D3 and others, as well as uh, that fish oil I was telling you about earlier. Zero hunger, zero cravings, completely satisfied with my meals. Uh, I, I used to struggle with sleep, getting maybe four to five hours of sleep and having trouble staying asleep. Now I get seven to nine hours a night pretty regularly in nutritional ketosis. I think clearer than ever before. I call that ketone power. Pimple and acne breakouts have been greatly reduced and I'm almost 41 and I still have these pimples growing on my What is up with that? Not now. And then anybody here have like skin tags, these little skin tag things, they're annoying as I'll get out here. They're shriveling up. They're going away. Happy days are here again, baby. So I'm enjoying the state of ketosis. This is a graph of my latest month. This is month number six of uh, being in nutritional ketosis. And you can see, uh, it's pretty, oh, you can't see the bottom, but basically this is my morning ketone. I, I measure in the morning time and then in the evening time. I'm about to do my evening one here in a second. But um, the morning time is 2.1 millimolar average. And you can see sometimes it got really high, sometimes it got kind of low. But the average is right around 2.1. That's pretty good. This is the nighttime one. You notice it kind of got a little bit higher. The average at night is 4.2 millimolar, which is exactly double uh, the morning production. And your uh, ketone production will actually be higher at night. So if, if you're saying, well, I can't really afford to buy a lot of strips and do all that crazy thing that Jimmy Moore did, if you test in the morning, know that that's your lowest reading of the day. If you test at night, know that that's going to be your highest reading of the day. So let's check my numbers. And my hands are so freezing right now, so it's hard to get blood to come out of these things, but we'll do our best. I want to show you how easy it is, because you might be wondering, that looks like it's gonna hurt. But I don't think it's gonna hurt. I've done it every day for six months, so of course I don't think it's gonna hurt. Although the cold can help, it can numb the fingers a little bit. Jam your finger in the door. There we go. I'll pass. All right, so this is my blood glucose monitor. This is my blood ketone monitor. All right, so you stick those strips in there, and this is the part people who freak out about. I just do it and get, get it over with. I think I'm getting some blood. Blood, I see blood. All right, so let's get the ketone meter. 
right, so we got that one going. That one takes 10 seconds. Oh, this is the one that takes 10 seconds. All right, so you hear that? All right, so my blood sugar was 77. <coughs> At like four. That's good. And a half. It's lowish. Nice. So it's low. It's good. Good low. My blood ketones. Two point two. Okay. So that's what you're looking for. You want to be between that point five and three point zero, and that's exactly where we are. So, definitively speaking, being in nutritional ketosis is having blood ketones between zero point five and three point zero. I think two point two qualifies, right? And I tend to feel best when I'm around two point zero. Blood ketones. Do I, do I look like I feel pretty good right now? <laughs> I do, actually. So uh, here is a reminder. My wife left a few uh, messages reminding me to check, have you check your blood sugar. <laughs> so my blood sugar. You might be wondering what's going on. So this is a graph from when I first started. When I first started this in May and June of 2012, my blood sugar was kind of wacky. Okay? It was like in the low 90s, or excuse me, upper 90s, low 100s. That's not good. Now, I mean, it's decent, but if you're trying to stabilize blood sugar, you really want it lower than that. So I started nutritional ketosis. I started doing a few things, and this is the result of my latest update. After six months on this, you'll see the, the numbers are coming way down, especially early in the month. You can see regularly low 70s. I just had a 77 reading on that. Upper 70s, low 80s is pretty consistent now. Now, I will have full disclosure here. I did take a supplement to kind of help with that because I wanted to see if I could really get my blood sugars down because I figured if I got the blood sugars down and we could get the blood ketones up, that was my goal because I wanted fat burning to happen. <laughs> so I took this supplement. It's called Glycosol. Um, that's the brand name. The uh, name of the supplement is called Berberine. I'm not sure if you can get it here in Australia, but it certainly helped me over the past three months. Now, I did stop it right before I came to Australia, and since I've been in Australia, my blood sugar has been about what it normally is and has been being on that. So perhaps nutritional ketosis has kicked in and helped me uh, keep it stable. So the guy goes to the doctor and he sees this big number on there and he says, is that the stock market? No, sir, that's your cholesterol. <laughs> So, lipid panel changes. So, in America, we have this um, panel that we can run called an NMR lipoprofile test. It's only available in the United States from Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, at a place called LipoScience. And I had one run on October the 25th after doing this for about five and a half, almost six months. My HDL. C uh, is 65, that's 1.7 millimolar. That's pretty good. I mean, anything above the uh, HDLC of 50, and I wish I could do that in my head, what the translation would be, is good. Um, you, you definitely want to try to get it as high as you can because HDL is what, what you want. Um, above 50, uh, the 1.3 millimolar um, is outstanding. Triglycerides, something that Rod alluded to earlier as well. 46. That's incredible. It's 0.5 millimolar. Anybody have uh, 0.5 millimolar triglycerides or less? It's hard to get there. Anybody under 1.0? Yeah. yeah. It's hard to get them down. The only way you really cut them is cutting carbs and cutting protein. So below 100 or 1.1 millimolar is stellar. So this next uh, bit of information is from that NMR that you, you, you guys can't run. I'll tell you what you can do here in a minute to get a proxy for this. But LDLP, uh, you're looking for the percentage of LDL particles that are floating around in your body that are small versus large. Well, the small, according to this test, 221 of them out of the 3,451 LDL particles in my body are the small. The small is what you're trying to not have. That's just 6% of my total LDL particles are that dangerous kind. In other words, 94% of 
are the large fluffy kind that you do want. So uh, there's a lot of people in America that get this NMR run and those numbers are inverted. They have 94% small dense LDL particles. They're a heart attack waiting to happen. So the, uh, I will fully disclose there are a few questions still out there about the significance of what LDLP and something that I think you guys need to do an APOB test for low carb dieters. So there's a very popular gentleman in America who has a blog called Eating Academy. His name is Dr. Peter Atia. And again, we're getting cut off there a little bit at the bottom. But basically, uh, this was a comment that was left by Nalsi on his blog uh, talking about um, the NMR test. Well, what do you do if you can't get an NMR? And he basically uh, had a question about getting an APOB and if that's a uh, proxy for the NMR, it, it really is actually, so you can measure whether your LDLP, which APOB is a proxy for, um, is actually in the right range. So his response basically was, yes, get an APOB test done. Uh, that is the bottom line, you can't see it up there, but the bottom line for Australians is get an APOB. So when you go to your doctor, uh, it's spelled A-P-O and then capital B if you want to ask for that. So lipid changes, and th this top line will freak out a few of you. Total cholesterol is 359, or 9.3 millimolar. Anybody got higher than 9.3 in here? I don't think so. How about LDLC is 285, and that's 7.4 millimolar. That's pretty high as well, according to conventional standards. So these are high looking uh, at them through the prism of conventional wisdom regarding health. But as Rod said, you don't test, you don't know. I wanted to test. I wanted to know. And there's a lot of reasons why I wanted to know. And I've got a question here in a second. But most physicians would be putting me on a statin drug right now. And very, very, very high dose of statin drug. But here's my question. How is it possible that I simultaneously have outstanding HDL and triglycerides, which are better than everybody in this room, and yet... I have horrible LDLP and APOB, which is higher than everybody in this room. How, how is that possible to have two things that say, yes, you're very heart healthy, and yes, you're very not heart healthy at the exact same time? So I really want to know the answer to that question. I'm going to set out to investigate that. This is what happened when I told uh, the nurse uh, what my cholesterol was. So my current, here's some more food for thought. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you, yeah, lipoprotein little a is another one. Yeah, little a is another one. Yeah, I have, I don't have that information on these slides here. Um, that is definitely a good one. But APOB is kind of a good proxy for LDLP because you guys can't run it here. APOB is a good one. But you're right, lipoprotein little a. Uh, is a good one to run as well. So, um, some more food for thought about my health. My current A1C, which is this test that you can have run. Anybody ever had an A1C run? Okay, Rod has. <laughs> and me. And Christina know has too. So basically, an A1C test is where they test your blood and it gives you the average blood sugar reading for the past three months. Okay? Mine came in at 4.5. Uh, which is an average blood sugar reading of 83 nanogram, uh, uh, milligrams per deciliter. That's really good. Uh, my la latest CT heart scan, I had uh, where they basically do a, a chest scan. Anybody had one of those done where they do a CT scan of your chest to see if there's any calcium buildup? Do you have those? Zero was the calcium score. No artery clogging anything. My triglyceride to HDL ratio is a microscopic 0.7, which anything under 4.0 is incredible. My insulin resistance score uh, is something that was on my, my lipid panel. It was 11. Anything under 45 is good. My VLDL, which is something we uh, heard some about in the Melbourne event yesterday, was, quote, too low to be measured. Now, VLDL, you want it low as possible. They couldn't even measure it. It was so low. And again, this is all on nutritional ketosis that this is happening. And then Rod talked to, talked to you about statins as to why they might be helpful for people 
because they have an anti-inflammatory effect. Well, guess what? Nutritional ketosis does too. My C-reactive protein, which is a key marker for in inflammation, CRP, was 0.7. Really, anything less than 1.0 is just unbelievably incredible. So what am I going to do about these questions I have about lipids? I'm currently in the process of writing a book about it. I'm going to interview a lot of the top experts in the world about what these lipid numbers mean. The book's going to be called A Patient's Guide to Understanding Cholesterol Test Results. Certainly hope it's available in Australia. I will make it happen if it has to happen. We'll make sure you guys get a copy if you want one. Um, it's coming out later uh, next year. I plan on writing a chapter on each of the major cholesterol markers to share what matters most. So if you're concerned, well, what does HDL mean? Why do I need it in my body? What are the levels that are optimal? What blah, 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 blah. Just on and on. We'll provide that in that book. So here's a novel concept I want medical professionals to start paying attention to and embrace in their interactions with their patients. How about we start treating actual disease rather than risk factors? Because really all we're looking at with cholesterol is risk factors, right? There's really no disease there. Yes, I have high LDLP. Yes, I have the ApoB that's high as well. Those are two correlating markers. Everything else is incredibly stellar, okay? None of that really matters except for what's going on in here. Right? So if there's no disease happening in here, what disease do I have? Doctors are treating symptoms, they're not treating actual disease. So let's move on to exercise. You can't see the bottom, but this lady says, my whole routine lasts an hour and a half, 15 minutes of cardio, 15 minutes of weights, and an hour of talking myself into doing it. <laughs> have I been there? So you might be wondering, okay, you're doing all this Talk about nutrition, yeah, let's see how you do going to the gym, all right? To me, this is the most exciting part of being on this experiment so far, even more than the weight loss, which you'll hear about in a minute. So I held off on doing any kind of intense exercise for the first four months. I did that deliberately. I wanted the nutrition to dictate what was going on. Plus, I wanted to give my body time to become fully keto-adapted with a consistent 2.0. Remember, that 2.0 is where I feel best. So I, I was noticing when I hit that 2.0, I had such unbelievable energy, it kind of gave me a sneak peek of what was coming. I used to go to the gym and get so bad side effects of hypoglycemia. Anybody had hypoglycemia where your blood sugar just goes, Bleh. it's horrible. Especially when I try to do high intensity training. So I try to do uh, like running on the treadmill, I try to lift really heavy, intense. I would get dizziness, blackouts, fatigue, hunger, nausea. Yeah, no wonder people hate going to the gym, right? So these are some of the symptoms that you'll see when you have hypoglycemia, the shaking, the sweating, the anxious, dizziness, hunger, all those kinds of things. So listen to this. Despite eating a low-carb diet, these effects were all very real to me, and my performance always had suffered as a result. So in the past, I always tried adding in high sugar fruit or starchy carbohydrates. I was told, oh, you need those things for fuel. You need those things if you're going to energize your workouts, right? But it was always a short-term solution that never really resolved the problem. So always attempting to lift and exercise in a fasted state, which I had also interviewed a lot of people. Oh, man, you're going to have such great energy if you just go to the gym and I Fasted state. So like right now, you know, tomorrow morning, you wake up and it's 20 hours fast. Yeah, I go to the gym. Oh, that sounds like torture. Horrible. Why would you do that? And then, to make matters worse, I would take 7 to 10 days to recover between workouts because of the delayed onset muscle soreness. All that happened prior to nutritional ketosis. So I bet you're wondering, how did it go? No, I didn't turn into that kind of thing. So your glycogen tank only gives you about 2,000 calories worth of energy, okay? So if you're relying on 2,000 calories from your glycogen stores in your muscles, guess what happens when that 2,000 calories is burned up? You have to consume more glycogen calories, so that's sugars and carbs. That's why they tell you, eat the sugars, eat the carbs, for the energy. But check this out. You get keto adapted, you get into nutritional ketosis, Look at how many calories you have at your disposal, and that's of somebody that's lean. 
not somebody that's overweight. 40,000 calories plus. I'm getting this information, by the way, from that book I told you about, the Bullock and Finney book, The Art and Science of Low Carbon Performance. So, would you rather have 2,000 calories of energy from your glycogen stores, or would you rather have 40,000 calories from your fat stores, which you'll never run out, there's no way you would possibly work out enough to burn all 40,000 of those calories. So what I wanted to do, I wanted to prove, I wanted to test their, their hypothesis, because they say you got all this energy that's available to you when you're fully keto adapted. So I committed to full uh, body weightlifting every single, uh, or every three days, excuse me. Um, so I did a full body workout every three days, uh, which basically worked out to two 30 minute high intensity, very heavy resistance training sessions weekly. I was extremely skeptical about the negative effects that had become commonplace with doing that. And to add insult to injury, I decided, you know what, let's just go full on and test this theory to the nth degree. I did it in an 18 to 24 hour fasted state. Okay? Am I crazy? Ask my wife. Absolutely I'm crazy. Not as crazy as that baby. So here's what happened. No dizziness, no blackouts, no fatigue or weakness, robust energy, no hunger or cravings, surprisingly full strength, invigorating post-workout feeling, quick muscle recovery. Basically the opposite of everything that used to happen. And it's all because of the nutritional ketosis. And believe me, I was highly skeptical. I didn't think this was going to work. It totally took me by surprise because I would never have believed it if I had not seen it for myself. I've gotten stronger and stronger, seeing more and more muscle definition each week. Strength gains are much more interesting to me than weight loss success. And in fact, I felt like Superman. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go to the next slide. Thank you. So you might be thinking, okay, that's cool and everything. Excuse me. That's cool and everything. But what about the weight and fat loss you've experienced? I know you all want to know. Right? Check this out. I'm so glad you asked. So in six months, help me with the kilos, 53.6 pounds is about 25, 26 kilos-ish, something like that. Of course, I've lost about four or five more uh, pounds, two, two more kilos since I've been here, so it probably is closer to 25 kilos now in six months of doing this. I think that's a call for celebration. <laughs> okay, I can't dance, but I can sure lose weight. All right, so how can you be sure, you might be wondering this, I know it's on your mind. How can you be sure your weight loss success isn't muscle loss? Yeah, you're doing all that gym work, yeah, but yeah, there's no way. With such a low protein, 12% of your calories, if they tell you if you want to build muscle, you have to eat gobs and gobs of protein. Who's heard that before? I did. I believe it. Drinking these protein shakes and all that. I think I have to take her. I'll take her down. So fat loss and muscle growth. Now there's this technology out there called a DEXA scan. I'm not sure. Do you guys have a DEXA scan in Australia? Or can test? So basically tests for body fat percentage and lean muscle mass growth for body composition. So I'll show you what it looks like here in a second. But after four months on nutritional ketosis, I decided to get a DEXA scan on September the 13th. I did a follow-up DEXA scan just before this trip to Australia on November the 12th to see what changes had happened over that two-month period. Um, I want to thank Dr. Jeffrey Galvin from uh, Concord, North Carolina for uh, doing this. He basically provided this to me so I could use it in this slide. But let's take a look at the results. First, I want to show you what the DEXA scan looks like. So that's, that's what it is. Non invasive. I'm a very tall guy, so six foot three. It took that full 20 minutes to get all the way. But it basically is like a fax machine for your body. And it just takes forever. It basically takes a picture of you, which you'll see here in a minute. 
and it intensively measures exactly how much body fat is on your body, exactly how much lean muscle mass is on your body. So this is going to get technical here. Don't let this throw you. I'm going to interpret it for you. But that's the results of the DEXA scan. So you can see I've had the two DEXA scans. It'll be a little bit hard, so I'm going to go to the next slide so you can see better. Here's some of the highlights. In those two months, I lost 9.7 pounds of net weight loss. That's about four and a half kilos. I lost 5% of my body fat, which that's a lot. In two months, to, to whack off 5% is significant. 16.26 pounds of body, uh, body fat loss, so about seven and a half kilos. So I lost seven and a half kilos of actual body fat. Now you might be wondering, wait a minute, wait a minute. You lost 9.7 weight loss, but you said you lost 16.26 uh, pounds of body fat. Well, did you build muscle? Why, yes I did. 6.19 pounds, or about three kilos, of lean muscle mass was gained. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. 12% protein intake, and you gained that much muscle? That's a lot of muscle, by the way, in two months. You gained that much muscle? Yep, sure did. I didn't have any pre or post workout carbohydrates to aid in muscle growth. Uh, you might have heard, oh, okay, after a, a workout, you need to eat carbs. Anybody ever heard that? So you're told to do that because carbs produce insulin. Insulin promotes muscle growth. Okay, so that's the theory. Did I look like I needed any insulin to produce? Because my insulin's way low. It, I didn't need it. So where exactly did the fat loss and muscle gain happen? Let's take a look at those numbers. This is really exciting too. In my arms, which Rob wanted me to pull up my shirt and show you my arms, but I'm not going to. <laughs> In my arms, I lost 1.68 pounds, or about three quarters of a kilo, of fat, and I gained about one kilo of muscle. That's a lot in the arms. In the legs, I had 3.54 pounds uh, of body fat loss, again, one and a half kilos there, and I gained about one and a third kilos. My legs have always been pretty muscular, so putting on even more muscle would have been a, a monumental task. The trunk area, which is kind of in this area, uh, is where I lost most of the weight. I was really excited about that because I need to lose the weight here the most anyway. 9.65 pounds, or about four and a third kilos of fat was lost. And I gained muscle 5.2 pounds, or two and a third kilos, uh, in the trunk area. The android, uh, about a quarter kilo of fat loss, and about two thirds kilo of muscle gain. And the gynoid, about one kilo of fat loss, and a half a kilo of muscle gain. So these fat loss muscle gains, I expect to continue on my nutritional ketosis. So where do I go from here? It's been pretty cool seeing all the results, but I'm not done yet. I've been doing this for six months. I want to do it for another six months to at least see what's going to happen. So my plans are I'm going to stay the course, keep doing what I'm doing, keep seeing hopefully amazing results. I want to help others. And there have been so many who have written to me and said, dude, you are so inspiring me to do this because I've been stuck. My health, my health markers, my weight have all been stuck. This might be the thing for me. And people have written me and said, I'm trying this. It's working. Thank you so much. So I want to continue helping those people. You guys too, if you want. I want to provide resources to arm people with what they can do to experience weight and health benefits like I've seen. Uh, my cholesterol book publisher has heard about what I'm doing and they're like, you know, you want to write a book about this when you're done. So I'll be uh, hopefully writing a book about it. Um, I'm going to continue to track everything I've been tracking, but I also am going to solicit to my readers, hey, if you want to see me test something, help me out with it. Um, so I'm going to ask them, tell me what you want me to test, and I'll test it and post the results on my blog. I'm also thinking of when this is all said and done, giving all the raw data to, uh, to like a, a researcher. So go look at any one of those guys and, and let them take a look at it and maybe write a case study for a medical journal, which would be really cool. <clears throat> and more than anything, I want to see for myself and show others that eating this way is not crazy. Seems, seems pretty crazy to just say, hey, I'm eating 85% fat in my diet. Yeah, go for it, buddy. But I want to show people it is sustainable, that you can do it if it's properly implemented in the right way. 
So if you want to keep up with how this is going, I encourage you to visit my blog. It's called Living Levita Low Carb. You can Google it or it's livinglevitalowcarb.com slash blog. There's an N equals one tab at the top. All the information that I share with you tonight is in those experiments. You can look at all the details of, of how this is going and see all my future updates, which I update every 30 days, right around like the beginning to middle of the month. So check that out. In fact, when I get back from Australia, I have an update to do. So, so that's all the information I have for you. Do you have any questions?